Hello and welcome to Access Chat. We're delighted to welcome Claire Keneally from Inclusive Cork today. Claire, great to have you with us. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you're doing with Inclusive Cork? Hi Neil, thanks a million for having me on. Um, I'm really delighted actually um, to be a part of this. So um, a little bit about myself and Inclusive Cork. Um, I am I was a teacher. I trained as a teacher and I was teaching for 26 years. I am also vision impaired. And um, in the last 18 years, I was in the kind of further education sector, the vocational sector. And what I noticed was that my students with disabilities, even though they were succeeding very well in education, when it came to the time for work experience or getting jobs, they weren't getting them. So I saw a gap in the market. I think there is a whole talent pool, a group of people who are not getting employment simply because they have a disability. And because I have a disability and I had a very successful career, I felt that it was time to make a move and do something in this space around disability business inclusion. And I suppose my focus is on disability employment. So that's what Inclusive Cork is about. <laughs> Excellent. And um, I was actually in a discussion just today. Uh, not only is there a disability employment gap, and this is something I talk about quite a lot. I mean, in the UK, it's 31%. Uh, Canada, something similar. I don't know what it is in, in Ireland, but you know that's a significant number. But there's also... Uh, a disability pay gap as well um, and, and, and so these are things that that we all collectively need to address so do you, do you happen to know what the the figures for Ireland are in terms of the sort of disability employment gap well it's pretty appalling just like you said there it's probably around the 30 percent as well but it varies depending on what the disability is yeah so obviously um, there are many hidden disabilities that are employed and that people aren't disclosing about and so do we ever really know the true figures? Because when it comes to disability, I know in Ireland, um, and I know speaking for myself, I didn't disclose Neil. Like I was identified with my uh, vision impairment when I was 19. I dropped out of college. I eventually went back to college and finished my degree and I became a teacher. But during all that time, I never disclosed that I had a degenerative eye condition. Now, the condition I have is called Stargardt. It's a very unusual, it's a very rare uh, condition. And it starts when you're young and it slowly deteriorates over mm -hmm. time. So now I'm in my 50s, so obviously I'm, you know, very vision impaired. But in my 20s, I decided um, not to tell because it was back in the 80s, early 90s, and I really felt there was a stigma around disability. And I'll be honest, I went into interviews. I never put it on my CV. I never said it at interview. I was in my last job, I'd say about 10 years before I disclosed that I was vision impaired. So, and I think Dr. Caroline Casey has talked about this as well, about this kind of hiding your disability or masking it. But, you know, maybe we adapt to the society that we're in. And I think self-identity is a huge part of disability and when you are when you identify with something um, or when you're diagnosed with something maybe you don't want it or you don't want what is put on you by society so it takes a long time to deal with that and work around it but um, when I eventually disclosed it made work a lot easier. And when you disclose, you get the supports. And I suppose what I want to let, especially young people know who are starting out on their careers, be yourself, bring your full self to your job and get your supports. Because it's the only way that you can move forward. And, um, you know, not disclosing has a massive impact on your mental health as well not being able to be your true self. I, I totally agree. I was in denial for a long time. Um, I had people telling me I should um, get diagnosis for dyslexia. I ignored them. I assumed that 
because I had done reasonably well in education that I could not possibly be dyslexic and um, and that was quite tough actually because then I was failing in things and I didn't know and understand why I was failing at stuff so I totally agree with you that it's really important to come to terms with it and come out about it yes it's um, yes it's 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 a big thing you know it's an emotional burden not you know holding that inside um so for sure i mean i shed a few tears when when i got diagnosed but am i happier about myself now having been diagnosed yes uh, that's why i'm i'm seeing diagnosis for the other thing that people keep telling me that i am so <laughs> um because actually diagnosis is a positive thing um, because it allows you to come to terms with who you are and become comfortable with who you are and, and that allows, allows you to live more fully and and also get the help like you talked about because you know the difference between my experience in education prior to diagnosis and and post diagnosis was huge yeah I, I, I was so much more being capable to to produce written work given assistive technology than I was handwriting stuff previously. So that, that, that's just me. I know Deborah's got a question. I just wanted one final thing, and that was the self-identity thing. As someone that is leading initiatives for a, a, a multinational organization, we have completely different metrics in all of our countries because of all of the different legislation and everything else so the only thing we can really do is encourage people to self-identify and it's through the work of organizations like yours that helps hope create more of an atmosphere where people feel comfortable to do it because well, that, that's, that's a, a huge thing yeah, and that's why I, I suppose for me because I worked with young people for so long like the majority of students that I was working with were probably between the ages of 18 and 25. I mean, there would have been older students as well, but that would have been the main cohort. And, you know, as you're, you are, we're only on this planet once, you know, and our life is for a certain amount of time. And when I just look back on my own journey and maybe I put obstacles in my own way. So I really want to empower young people and say, just be yourself. There's a place for us all. There's a job for us all. And you know, like, and they say, but I don't want my employer to know. And then you kind of think, you know what? Do you want to work for that employer anyway? I mean, if you can do the job and you're doing it without the supports, can you imagine what you can do with the supports? You'll be amazing, you know? So it's to empower young people to, um, yeah, be authentic. And because life is hard enough with or without a disability. But that disability is just that extra layer that, you know, can make or break you sometimes of having a good or a bad day, you know? Yeah, and, and you know, what's interesting about this topic is <clears throat> I also came out um, later in life with um, my disability. I always, I I figured out that I seemed to be a little different maybe than other people and got diagnosed with ADHD much later. And and now that I know it, it, it and I remember telling Neil, you know, Neil, you know, I, I I was diagnosed with ADHD. He's like, duh. I mean, how did you not know that, Deborah? But, you know, sometimes you just don't know. But what's interesting, I think, is just from my own diagnosis is I see myself getting into certain situations, especially when it's really busy, which I'm really busy. And I I now understand how my brain works and what I need to do to make sure that I don't tip over into making myself sick and blah, blah, blah. So, but at the same time, I think, so one thing I admire about what I'm seeing coming from the UK and, you know, Ireland and, you know, what I'm seeing happen is y'all are coming out and saying, I'm going to bring my best self to work and yeah. this is who I am and I'm proud of who I am. And I know it's, you know, it's still happening, but in the United States, people really are not doing that. They are not stepping up and saying, this is who I am because um, there is a great fear that employers will discriminate against them. Um, whether they find out and there is such a great fear. I remember talking to 
a gentleman that was very high up in the United States government, and he had been diagnosed, um, I, I forget what the diagnosis was, but it was a very serious diagnosis, and it was a degenerative, and so it was going to get worse. And I said, well, and so he told me, he disclosed to me that he had this, and I said, well, to have you told anybody? He said, oh, no, 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 and I won't, Deborah. I'm not telling anybody. And I said, but... If they knew, he said, if they knew, they would think I wasn't capable. They would think, it, why don't you go ahead and retire? What, and he said, and they would look at me with pity and charity. And, and these are huge issues that, I, it, you know, right now we're working with a group that wants to help uh, uh, U.S. companies with accommodations. And they came, and they're very successful in the U.K., but they came over to the United States. And nobody in these big companies they're working with will um, say, nobody nobody needs an accommodation in the U.S. And they're not asking for anything. And I said, they're not going to because they're afraid to. Because our government doesn't do what your governments do and, you know, diagnose, you know, how you do the disability and disclose it. We can't disclose any of that in the United States. And so people are really, really, really afraid to be their true self. And, and I think that's such a sad situation. And it's very unfair to the young people. So we're going to learn from you guys. But go ahead, Claire. But no, I think you've just highlighted something um, by that gentleman saying people will look at me with sympathy or tragedy. That does happen. That does happen. And that is one thing that really bothered me when, like, I went directly to, like, we'll say, the principal in my school and said, you know, I'm vision impaired. And he was great. He said, look, you can do your job because I'd already proved I could. And, you know, he said, just tell me what you need. And I was like, I need a large CCTV so that I can do my corrections. Because at this stage, um, you know, 200 essays to correct, you know, with handwriting, I'm like, I can't do this anymore with a magnifier. I needed, I needed assistive technology. That's why I, um, I disclosed um, to my employers. But when you tell colleagues and you do get that sympathy and tragedy and, oh, you poor thing, and, oh, how, you know, I hate it. Absolutely hate it. So I can understand completely why people don't um, disclose. And the other side of that, guys, is um, progressive pathways. I think when you have a disability um, and you're in an organization, it's harder to progress because maybe you're not always given the opportunities or the challenging portfolios, etc. Um, because they're kind of looking after you because, oh, who are you? <laughs> you know? So I think there's a big conversation to have around disclosure and then to be ensured that you still have the same opportunities as everyone else in the organization. Yeah, huge I agree. point. I agree. And, and, and I think also, you know, as we, I, I think it's a really important thing for us to talk about as societies because um, if people if people are afraid to disclose, not only does it hurt them, but it's hurting the company's bottom lines. And I think that's what employers don't understand is that if you will allow people to get the the accommodations that they need and they need, and it might be a very very simple accommodation. Um, my ADHD makes me very hyperactive, and so I do better when I do. I have a stand-up desk, and so you know I have my own company, so I'm always standing. But it just helps. It almost helps my brain think better. And so I think if we don't figure this out as a society, what is going to continue to happen is that individuals are held back, but also employers need to understand their bottom line, productivity, creativity, innovation, all that is impacted too. So the employers should be motivated to encourage the for you always to bring your best self to work. And so let me hand it to you, and then I know that uh, Antonio has a question. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, Claire. Um, yeah, no, I, I think I've, I've said what I had to say around, um, you know, progressive pathways and that, but like you can bring your authentic self, I suppose, and then it's about as well what I tell people. I've done a lot of work recently with the National Council for the Blind of Ireland. We call it the NCBI. And what I say to them is, um, you know, take ownership of your vision impairment, because what I know from vision impairment um, is my vision impairment is very different to retinitis pigmentosa or very different to diabetic retinopathy or very different to glaucoma. Um, 
so even as a group, when I was in the room and we were all vision impaired or blind, I'm like, we are a very diverse group, you know, and what we can all do is very different. Um, but to take ownership of it and to know what supports you need to go in knowing the technologies that work for you, because don't expect your line manager to know it because they will not. Right. And um, not to expect to go into an organization that they because disability is very complex. You know, it is complex. There is fear around it. There's a lot of myths and stereotypes around it. So you can't expect one HR manager or one line manager to know everything about you. Because, you know, as they say, one person with a disability is one person with a disability. Everyone is different. We all have our unique experiences. So I think the other part of being empowered as a young person with a disability is knowing what you need. So when you walk into the job, you bring what you need with you or you know exactly what supports are needed within there and let them know because they won't be able to tell you what you need. And then the other side of that, I was actually at a seminar yesterday in Dell EMC here in Cork. We've got some really good companies who are doing a lot of work around disability and neurodiversity. And, um, you know, we had a little discussion around supports and technologies because what if somebody with a disability is working in an organization and that organization got them all the equipment? Now, even if they got the equipment with grants for the government, they got them the equipment. But hey, you're working there, you're really good, and you have an opportunity to work in another organization. But it's much harder for a person with a disability to get up and leave and to continue on a progressive pathway in another, like to leave a job and start a new one. Because they're like, who owns the technology? Now, I was assured yesterday that it's the person. It travels with the person unless it's nailed down or concreted down into the organization. And um, you should be able to take your technology with you. And I think that's key for people to know you're not stuck. You're not trapped. If Apple offer you a better ideal or VMware headhunt you, you can move. You're not stuck in one organization. Yeah, that's that's a huge point. Antonio, I know you've, you want to comment. So I, I was going in plus into that because I, I know, Claire, that you have been, you have been uh, doing some uh, workshops with some companies uh, uh, around Cork. So what I wanted to know is what type of uh, uh, reception you, were, you got from them and what have you learned from those engagements? Okay, so what I'm offering is training. OK, I do disability awareness um, training and companies or what I like to call Antonio is disability confidence. So what I've learned from going into companies is that there is a lot of fear around disability and especially around mental health. They it, because they can't see it, they can't measure it. And what they're afraid of is absenteeism, that if they hire people with disabilities that they will not show up to work. Um, I think when they see someone like me and they think, oh, vision impairment, we can handle that. You know, we buy you a big screen or, you know, we give you some software like JAWS, then you can work. But I always say, because I'm very open about my own mental health, I'm like, do you really think you get a diagnosis at age 19 that you're going to lose your eyesight and it doesn't affect or impact your mental health? Like, Hello, of course it does. And um, look, I suppose what I've learned through my life um, is that everyone um, has, is impacted by mental health issues at some stage of their life, whether it's grief or, you know, marital breakdown or whatever. We're, we're all impacted and having to look after our mental health um, in some way. So what I've learned is that um, we need to talk about it. We need to open the kimono, be raw, and talk straight and practical, and to offer practical solutions um, around it. And what I always say is, especially if I'm in a group, I've done talks in different companies and I've done trainings, but what I always let people know as well, you are under no legal obligation to disclose your disability. No legal obligation in Ireland to disclose your disability. I advise you. I think it's a great idea to disclose and get the supports, but you don't have to. Um, so that people know they can do it when they're ready. And that's especially around um, hidden disability. 
you know. Um, I think employers need the supports, and I don't think they're very aware of all the government supports that are available. So I spend a lot of time actually. Um, I do a podcast, and Antonio and Deborah, you've both been on my disruptability podcast. And a lot of time is spent on the podcast on just informing businesses of the supports that are available that, to them to be able to uh, employ, recruit, and retain disability in the workplace. Because what I know is uh, some organizations in, in Ireland are on that journey, but their counterparts in other parts of the world, they already saw, addressed some of the issues. Uh, and But they are still trying to, f to figure out how to address them here. We, we have, in the past, we had guests from VMware who are working in accessibility and inclusion uh, inside that organization, and they are recognized leaders on their field of, uh, of expertise. So I think it's uh, for Irish organizations, it's also particularly important sometimes when we're talking about international organizations to connect internally, because they are going to be able to find a lot of people in their own organizations who are uh, working in the exact same topics, you know, somewhere around. I totally agree. Uh, for example, you're dead right with VMware. You know they're doing amazing work out there, and I spoke recently at the VM Inclusion uh, Conference. But I've also interviewed Terry Haver Byrne, as ye did on Hashtag Access Chat, and what a resource they have! I mean, she is amazing. The information that she has, and I wanted her on disruptability to be able to like share with my listeners all of this information. I think that's key. And look, we're in a space with diversity and inclusion, especially I think with disability business inclusion, where we are willing to share, you know? And I suppose um, I'm very lucky. I'm at the beginning of my journey with Inclusive Cork. And I mean, Antonio, Deborah, Neil, you've all come right behind me with Inclusive Cork. And I really appreciate that. And I suppose one of my mottos here is that I want best international practice, but implemented at a local level. And I called it Inclusive Court because I don't drive anymore, right? I want to be able to do something at a local level in Cork City because, you know, I also have two kids, the dinner has to be cooked, da da da, you know, like life is going on. I'm one person, all right? So I'm not calling myself like inclusive global the world yet, all right? <laughs> because um, my priority is my relationship and my kids and my own self care and health. And then making Cork as inclusive as I possibly can. And part of that is the Disruptability Podcast. So talking to the experts in Palo Alto or in Virginia or in England, wherever you are, share what works. And then I'll share it here in Cork or in Kerry or wherever I can get to and let Irish people know about it too. And um, that's, that's all I can do at the moment. You know, Maybe it'll get bigger in the future, but at the moment I can just do what one woman can do. Excellent, and 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 those conversations are really valuable, and and uh, those interconnections are really valuable too. Uh, I totally agree with then Antonio. We were in Spain, and we were talking to VMware people, and they were like, "Oh, we didn't know about Sherry." Oh. Like, well, yeah, you've got this resource, and that's that's not uncommon. This this happens a lot. But it's not just around disability that this happens. Large organizations operate in silos. It's, it's almost inevitable that, um, that these large organizations are replicating initiatives or, or, or going their own way because it's almost impossible to keep on top of what, everything that's going on when your organization's got tens of thousands of people in there. Sometimes it's actually easier for them to find out about this stuff from the outside. So that's yeah. why it's really important to have this sort of uh, inside out and outside in approach. So that, uh, yes, by all means, raise it up within your own organization. But sometimes it's like, you know what? I've got 53 different email newsletters from various different parts of my organization. Am I going to read them all? No. Am I going to sort of sit down over um, you know, a glass of wine on a Friday night and check out some of the social media feeds? Yes. So then, you know, it's it, it's another opportunity to to connect those people. Deborah, I know you've got a comment. Well, I, I just I thought it was such a good point that <clears throat> Antonio and Claire, you were both making in that 
Um, I see this as well in that uh, you will see companies that are um, trying really hard to include people with disabilities, uh, retain the talent, accommodate people. A lot of, they're really trying to do the you know good job of inclusion. And, but they're um, not just a national employer, you know, and so I'll see that they're doing it, they're making efforts, say, in the UK, maybe in the United States, the, almost always in the United States because of the compliance and the litigation that we're doing here. So they're, whether, whether or not um, our litigation efforts are making us better or actually causing a, a big divides between um, the community of people with disabilities and the employers. That's a whole nother show. But um, I see companies that um, are, are making a lot of efforts, like for example, in the US and the UK, but they have employees in a lot of other countries and they make zero efforts there. And I say to them, why? Why are you doing it, for example, just in the U.S.? Is it because you're afraid you're, we're going to sue you? Is this not really part of the core of who you are as a company, which I think was sort of the point that Antonio was making? And, and I love what you said, Claire, in that I want to make a difference locally. I, I have work balance. I want to be here for my children, my family. But I want to make a difference right here. And I think that was just such an important point that we do have to look at this globally, nationally, um, in, for, in my case, statewide, because every single state in the United States does things differently, and then locally. Those things are so important. But I, I think corporate brands send the wrong message when they're just focused on some really cool stuff. But it's only in the U.S. and in the U.K. because there's so much uh, innovation happening in the U.K. And in the U.S. there's so much innovation happening there too, but so much litigation. I, I think that corporations send the community um, the wrong message by not making this a commitment across their employee base. So, uh, and I, you know, I, I'm, it's more of a statement, but Claire, I didn't know if you wanted to uh, address that. No, I, I, I think, you know what, Barbara, You've made a very important point, and I came from public service, okay, where I was always working with people. And I'll be honest, when I jumped ship and I was coming into private sector and, you know, going into corporations, I felt a bit like an alien because the language is very different. But what I realized is we're all still people. They're the same people working in Apple or Dell or VMware than they are in any secondary school or further education college that I had worked in already. And I think corporations nearly really need to think about people. I mean, their people are the most important asset, right? And Antonio, you asked me earlier, what have I learned from going into organizations? What I learn is they want, they want to quantify it all the time. Like, what percentage of people do we have with disabilities? And I'm saying to them, you have so many people with disabilities who will never tell you they have a disability because they won't disclose. But we've, we've talked about the whole disclosure thing. If companies and corporations really want to support disability in the workplace, I think they could even look at parents with children with disabilities. Because what I'm hearing from and um, my friends who have children with disabilities are from other professionals who are either educational psychologists or speech and language therapists, and they're on these multidisciplinary teams, and they are giving the diagnosis of whatever um, disability. They feel they are letting the parents walk out the door, and the parents are absolutely stunned. They don't know where to go. There are very few um, supports for them. And I think that's one place where multinationals and corporations could come in. And instead of just always looking for the person who is disabled to put up their hand and say, hey, I'm disabled. Um, you can tick me as one of your percentage points. You know, start running programs for education and supports for the parents. Um, of children with disabilities or as I often say when I go in and I do training I'm like look one in seven people in Ireland according to the last census in 2016 and um, according to that one in seven people have a disability in Ireland right now I think it's probably higher than that right that is probably one in six or one in five right but one in seven who tick the box right and um, but one in three of us love someone who has a disability 
Okay, so say I'm a family of four. I have a husband and two kids. I'm the one who's vision impaired. My kids get it. Like, they know when we're going into a restaurant or when we're going into a hotel. They're like, oh, mom, you're going to love this. Oh, mom, you're going to hate this. They know because they love me and they've lived with it all their lives. And it's very normalized. It's mainstreamed in our house. Okay. And I think if when they're doing, when I do disability confidence training, I say, look, this isn't just for the workplace. Because I know you work and you work very hard when you're in the workplace, but you go out and you have, you know, other relationships. Maybe you are a leader in a scout group. Maybe you are a referee in a under 12s rugby game on Saturday. Maybe you're training soccer or tennis or coaching swimming. You're going to meet disability everywhere, everywhere. You're going to have kids or young adults are older people in your life, your neighbours, etc. And you want to be confident with that wheelchair or with that interpreter or with that um, companion dog or guide dog or service dog, you know. So when I do the training, I'm like, yes, your company is providing you this training in your company, but it's not just for the company because it's, it's about the community. It's about the people. It's about our quality of life while we are on this earth that it is a good one, you know, and to be kind and compassionate and include everyone and just include everyone. Yep, wonderful. Uh, just so you know, um, and maybe we can share with you, we have within our organization uh, a carers network. So we totally get the need for if we want to include people with disabilities and be disability inclusive, that includes the parents and the partners and everything else. Um, and a couple of years back, we actually produced, um, our, our network produced a storybook. So people were telling their stories from the perspective of being a parent or a person with a disability. Uh, and we put that out. And, and um, that's been really well received because actually those, those personal stories help create the atmosphere that uh, you know, enables people to feel more comfortable about disclosing or identifying, because disclosure sounds like a dirty word. So um, it does. It sounds like I've got something bad to tell you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, thank you so much for, for being our guest today. Uh, and also thank you to, to, to Microlink and Barclays and MyClearText for continuing to support us. You know, we're, we've been rolling for five years almost now, very close to that anniversary. Um, you know, it's almost time for me to grow another moustache to celebrate. Um, so thank you very much, Claire. It's been a real pleasure. We look forward to you joining us on Twitter on Tuesday. Thank you so much, Neil and Deborah and Antonio. Um, I really appreciate all your support. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you.